Star Wars 1313 feels a little bit like unfinished business. For years, it's been a mystery, from its iconic E3 announcement to the rumors it starred Boba Fett, from its connection to a lost live-action TV show to its unceremonious cancellation in the last days of LucasArts. It's been the subject of over 10 years of speculation, and its pieces are still being found in different projects to this day. This is Star Wars 1313, the last LucasArts game. At the end of the prequels, the future of Star Wars was pointed at the small screen. Having reinvented filmmaking as a medium for nearly 30 years, Lucasfilm was returning to where it hadn't really been since the young Indiana Jones Chronicles in the late 80s. At Celebration 3 in 2005, George Lucas announced two shows. One was the long-running CG animated Clone Wars show for Cartoon Network, whose impact is still felt in the series to this day. The other was Underworld, a live-action mature look at Coruscant's darker side set between the two trilogies, showing the galaxy's center from a below-ground-level perspective as the Republic became the galactic empire seen in the original trilogy. Despite never going into full production except for the third-party test footage that leaked in 2020, nearly 50 scripts would be written over the next few years. Under Lucas, a team of television's strongest writers, including Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica's Ronald D. Moore, would tell their story with no deadline or budget, exploring the blue sky of the period, with scripts ranging from origins for characters like Han Solo and Palpatine, to even a pitched idea from ILM creative officer John Knoll around the stealing of the Death Star plans. It was a long pre-production period, but the show was poised internally as a huge offering to fans akin to a movie release. And with that came a tie-in game from LucasArts. In 2009, however, LucasArts wasn't on the surest of footings. While the last 12 months had seen the release of The Force Unleashed, their fastest selling game ever, it had also seen the sudden resignation of President Jim Ward and the cancellation of both Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings and Free Radicals Battlefront 3. The Force Unleashed aside, the 360 generation had seen the studio as essentially a publisher licensing out the Star Wars IP, with their own developments struggling to make it over the line. According to Jason Schreier's book Blood, Sweat & Pixels, there was a culture clash between LucasArts and Lucasfilm. While the game studio had been working more closely with Lucas' special effects house ILM on their titles, going as far as to move into the same building during the development of the Staff of Kings, the greater Lucas Empire, and by all accounts George Lucas himself, didn't quite understand video games, nor, as fidelity increased, the costs that came with them. This was made most obvious when the team would present their budget and staffing needs to executives for their Underworld game. Their intentions for a GTA-style open world was immediately stripped back and turned into something more linear and much cheaper. Internally, the team dubbed it Gears of Star Wars, a comment on its now cover-based gameplay, taking inspiration from the buddy shooter genre and more cinematic platformers like Uncharted. With a deadline that was dependent on the production of the Underworld show, and with Lucasfilm's focus on the Clone Wars instead, the team at LucasArts would take the opportunity to have an extended pre-production on their end. Per Schreier, their goal was to solve gameplay problems early, grayboxing the minutia now to make movement and combat have strong bases and build from there. The project had started taking on a life of its own, while work on the show was getting quieter and quieter. And as a result, it'd be renamed to Star Wars 1313 after the 1313th level of Coruscant, where the bulk of the game took place. It was around this time, however, that LucasArts would lose another president in Daryl Rodriguez. Following that, a few months later, during the already arduous development of the Second Force Unleashed, longtime LucasArts executive producer Hayden Blackman would also depart the company. The LucasArts team had been split between the two projects with 1313 being worked on for well over a year at that point, and targeting release date on then unannounced next-gen hardware, and The Force Unleashed 2, targeting release by the end of 2010. While it's unclear how much involvement Blackman had on 1313, he had long been a guiding voice to the Star Wars projects of that era, and losing him and the head of the company so close to The Force Unleashed 2's release was a hard blow to the studio. It's partially speculation on my part, but to me, this is where the real problems with 1313 and LucasArts as a whole became terminal. With Rodriguez's departure, a Lucasfilm executive would fill in temporarily before the hiring of Paul Megan in June, 
Under Megan, only three months later, in less than eight weeks before the release of The Force Unleashed 2, LucasArts would lay off one-third of their staff, about 80 people in total. With the executives being directly involved, new leadership at the top of the company, and the recent departure of key creatives, there was less insulation between LucasArts and Lucasfilm than there had ever been. And with that came more oversight from Big George. 1313 did not start life as a Boba Fett game. While rumors swirled around its announcement and cancellation that the main character seen in demos, portrayed by future Bullseye actor Wilson Bethel, wouldn't be the main character come release, and over the years concept art would circulate featuring Boba Fett, 1313 was at this point in development, intending to star an original character. With that increased oversight and input from Lucas came more meetings. In two months before planned reveal at E3 2012, the word from George would be simple. 1313 should be a Boba Fett game. Very few characters short of a Force user would be a more dramatic gameplay shift. As while Bethel's character Rack Jaren was a bounty hunter, what he didn't have at any point was the Fett family jetpack, something that could and should change how the team would approach combat. This was non-negotiable even this far in development, and the team was forced to rework almost everything, trying to salvage what they could, throwing out a large portion of their progress from pre-production, and turning their story of an original bounty hunter into another origin story for the younger Fett. This is likely why leaked footage seen in 2022 doesn't actually feature the jetpack at all. Being an origin story, developers wanted certain iconic pieces to fall into place as he turned into the character seen in the original trilogy. His armor was much closer to Django's. Being a linear game, there was an opportunity to reuse at least some of what was created before Boba got his jetpack something that's mirrored in 2002's Bounty Hunter starring the Elder Fett. It's worth pointing out that a few months before E3 in 2012 lines up with the release of the Clone Wars episode Bounty, a late look at a young Boba Fett and a team of Bounty Hunters working alongside Ventress. The Mandalorian armor is missing at this point, with Boba opting for an original look due in part to Jango's helmet being destroyed during an assassination attempt on Mace Windu. It's not unlikely that this was part of why Fett was on Lucas's mind. On the other hand though, this seems to clash with in-development and unfinished future episodes of the show, which included a three-episode arc that ended with Boba Fett in his full armor, facing off with Cad Bane. Only a few minutes of animatics are available publicly, which implies that they were early in production, either intended for late season 7 or even the planned 8th season, as many other unfinished episodes like the Utapau arc are basically fully watchable with placeholder animations. While the textures we see aren't finished and could easily be replaced with something more in line with 1313 or even vice versa, it's interesting to see how both teams wanted to tell this part of Fett's story and how they were interpreting his armor. What's also interesting is that 1313 wasn't the only game that got an odd off-the-wall change from George Lucas around this time. Famously, Redfly Studios, who were working on a Darth Maul game that took place before The Phantom Menace, would have a meeting with George that ended with him insisting that Maul should team up with Darth Talon a character that existed some 200 years after the Maul origin story. George was unconcerned, and simply suggested they use a clone of Maul in the future instead. Redfly would also have to throw out much of their work before their project would also be cancelled. Regardless, E3 2012 would mark the first time the public would see Star Wars 1313. What we got was a look at cinematics and actual gameplay, with that Gears of War slash Uncharted approach as Bethel's smuggler jumped from crumbling ships and had tense shootouts with unnamed bounty hunters. It looked impressive and caught people's eye as a change of pace from LucasArts' other offerings, even more since it was intended to have a mature rating, something that fell in line with George's vision of the Underworld TV show taking influence from HBO. What was also interesting was what console this was targeting. While 2012 was about a year out from the announcement of the PS4 and Xbox One, word on the show floor was that 1313 and Watch Dogs, which was also announced that week, weren't going to be on current-gen hardware. While no confirmation came from Ubisoft or LucasArts, it was known that 1313 was running on a heavily modified late version of Unreal Engine 3, which Epic confirmed was the same build that they had used on a next-gen proof of concept shown off earlier that year at GDC. Over the next few months, developers working on 1313 would meet with the press and release developer diaries discussing their vision and a look inside a more unified Lucas Empire. While they would never announce a switch to Boba Fett to the public, a team that had been beaten and bruised found themselves with a newfound morale boost. But in September, there would be a hiring freeze, and a month later, everything would change. Uh, and in the case of somebody who writes and directs, 
you know, it is my life. So I can't just sort of say, well, this will be fun and knock it off in a week. I have to, this is like a marriage. This goes on, you have to be in love with this thing for at least four or five years and probably for the rest of your life. It's hard to talk about the end of 1313 without talking about the end of an independent Lucasfilm. In 2012, George Lucas was 69 years old, slowly beginning pre-production on a new era of Star Wars films and staring down becoming a father again. Doing another trilogy at the pace he'd done before meant 10 hard years, which to him felt like the rest of his life. Even if he let someone else take over production, to Lucas that didn't feel like retiring. The production on Empire and Jedi had proved that already. In addition, production on Underworld had all but stagnated, and Clone Wars was recording what was intended to be its second to last season. There was no better time than now. In October, George would sell the Lucasfilm Empire to Disney for $4 billion, intending to create new entries in the Star Wars universe for both theaters and on television. It's worth pointing out that, despite the cancellation of projects like Clone Wars, a large portion of the Lucasfilm production team stuck around, such as John Knoll, Doug Chang, and Dave Filoni. LucasArts, however, was a different story. Production on 1313 and its sister project, the unannounced multiplayer shooter First Assault, would continue for another five months before the studio would close its doors. Disney, whose own internal studio, Buena Vista, was frankly a bit of a money pit, saw the future of Lucasfilm-related games as something to be licensed out to external studios who already had the infrastructure, rather than being developed internally. Not long after, Electronic Arts announced their 10-year exclusivity deal with Lucasfilm, mentioning DICE, Visceral Games, and BioWare as studios developing the first in a new generation of Star Wars games. However, it's unclear if the latter was more in the continued support of their MMO, The Old Republic, or something new. Regardless, the team that had been developing 1313, which was still the big question mark around all the announcements, would find themselves 30 miles down the road at Visceral Games, pitching the project in the hopes that it would be picked up by Electronic Arts. Visceral, however, hadn't called the team down to the EA campus to revive 1313. Instead, they wanted to interview members of the LucasArts team and take them on for their own Star Wars game codenamed Project Ragtag which would feature former Naughty Dog studio head Amy Hennig at the helm, and would ironically lead to the closure of Visceral three years later. This was the final nail in both 1313 and LucasArts as a whole, and with Visceral's own trouble, it's hard to pin down how many, if any, took the studio up on the offer to work on Ragtag. 1313 was cancelled, and the future of Star Wars games was in the hands of EA, who were more focused on revitalizing the Battlefront franchise with DICE, the games as a service market, and honestly, releases that felt few and far between, as even their successes like Jedi Fallen Order were a long way from being worked on. Unlike a lot of canceled games, Star Wars 1313 wasn't the product of massive fan projects, huge leaked builds, and the entire team coming together to create something new. To be honest, the way Star Wars has largely shifted to television in the past few years it's a lot easier to point to Underworld's legacy instead. The way shows like Andor focus heavily on the day-to-day -day life of Coruscant and the inner workings of the Empire, to the return of the diet cyberpunk aesthetic in It and Kenobi, and more broadly almost every Disney Plus show featuring some connection to the complicated web of crime syndicates in the universe, it's hard to not feel that Underworld influence. Even the Star Wars story films Rogue One and Solo have origins that tie back to Lucas's ideas for the types of stories the show would tell. For 1313, however, Clone Wars has direct references to the level on Coruscant, and to catch a Jedi in the wrong Jedi in Season 5, longtime Dooku apprentice turned bounty hunter Asajj Ventress assists the fugitive Ahsoka in navigating levels 1312 to 1315, and later on in an unfinished episode that became the revival episode Gone with a Trace, Ahsoka finds herself alongside the Martez sisters who own a repair shop on 1313 specifically. Again, these do feel like products of Underworld more than anything as the last couple seasons of Clone Wars from about the Maul arc and beyond begin to push heavily into the Star Wars lowercase underworld, as the main players of the saga and expanded universe content were pushed into hiding. In both versions of 1313 we see, however, there are direct callbacks to the opening of the E3 demo, with characters traveling via that vertical tunnel. It's an iconic shot, and it's hard to not think of this as an intentional callback or product of a time when 1313 was actually expected to release. In games, however, Jedi Survivor's opening level takes heavy inspiration from 1313. 
While it takes place on level 2046 and isn't the Gears of War inspired buddy shooter 1313 was, platforming through the course on Underworld between trilogies like this is a nice throwback, even if it's only a small piece of the game, especially in a title that seems to wear its LucasArts influence on its sleeve. In 2022, Amy Hennig, who had headed up the now-canceled Project Ragtag from Visceral, would be tapped by Lucasfilm Games, which had been morphed into the licensing body that Disney had wanted, to return to work on Star Wars with her studio, Skydance New Media. The following year in June, former 1313 director Dominic Rebilliard would also announce that he was now working on the project. While no word is available at time of writing, it's interesting to see two former directors of two famously canceled Star Wars projects from two different eras working together in a post-EA exclusivity Star Wars market. Star Wars 1313 was, more than anything, the victim of time and place. In a different time or under different circumstances, it very likely could have come out. With its connection to so many different projects within Star Wars, it's almost a ghost whose presence is still felt in the universe and a reminder of the last days of not just LucasArts, but even the old expanded universe and Lucas himself. It's a complicated legacy, deservedly so, but it's also an interesting cross-section of Lucasfilm at the end of the prequels and a look into where Star Wars could have headed. <laughs> 